Chapter 11. Smokey Joe Wood. Some of the most exciting early games I saw were in 1912 when the Boston Red Sox came to town. They won the pennant that year and they always beat the White Sox. When I went to those games, Smokey Joe Wood, who belongs in the Hall of Fame, won 34 and lost 5 that year. In memory, it seems as though he hurled all those games against Chicago with the or shadows pushing over the ballpark. He would stand out there in the pitching mound in the red-trimmed gray road uniform, hitch hat up his pants, and throw. To this day, I have a hurry collection of strange sensations as if my head had emptied when he'd fired the ball and shat in the shadowy park. A white Sox could touch him. Perhaps Walter Johnson was faster than Wood. Perhaps Grove and Feller were. But Wood threw smoke. And in 1912, there was a better pitcher than Wood in baseball. Even Walter Johnson or Christy Mathewson. The difference was merely academic. No pitcher ever depressed a little boy in the stands more than Joe Wood did me. Why did the Boston manager Jake Stahl always have to pitch him against my White Sox? James T. Farrell, My Baseball Diary. Can I throw harder than Joe Wood? Listen, my friend, there's no man alive can and heart throw harder than Smokey Joe Wood. Walter Johnson, Interview, 1912. Excuse me. Um... You know, I often look back on it now. The Wild West, Buffalo Bill, cattle rustlers, outlaws, sheriff poses. I see these Western pictures on television and sometimes it just hits me. I actually lived through all that in real life. Sort of hard to believe, isn't it? At the turn of the country, the century, we lived in this little town of R.A. in the southwestern part of Colorado, not far from places with names like Lizard Head Pass and Slumgullion Gulch. And every day I'd see these big stagecoaches go by, drawn by six horses, two guards sitting up there with rifles guarding the gold shipment coming down from the mines. Dad was a lawyer there. His law partner was later the Attorney General of Colorado, and he was involved in some big cases for the Western Federation of Miners. During several of these cases, they had to send in the state militia to guard him. Feelings ran high about unions in Colorado back then. He was a great trial lawyer, Hardly ever lost a case in front of a jury. Later, we moved to Ness City, Kansas, about 60 miles north of Dodge City. And that was rough country, too. Dad represented the Missouri Pacific and Santa Fe Railroads there. Even though he was a lawyer, my father never could really settle down. 1897, he got the gold fever and went to the Klondike. Aiken in the gold rush, not as a lawyer, as a prospector. He returned with his legs frozen, you can diarrhea, and lots of great stories, but no gold. Later, he took off on another prospecting trip, this time to Nevada and California, but he didn't do any better there than he had in, in Yukon. He had a such such a full life, a brilliant man. He spent his last years in this very house. The house was where he was born, and when he died in 1944, he was only one month short of being 99 or 90 years old. I had a specific generator, a special generator, excuse me, put in there to give him electricity when they started. Then they started stringing electric lines through this part of the country. And we had to carry two motors for the different voltages. But he didn't ever have anything to do with any of it. Always used kerosene lamps and old ice 
the old ice box, the, the wood stove, wouldn't even use a coal furnace. He'd, he'd cut his own firewood for his little sh stove, and all the chores kept him going until he was almost 90. It was while uh, where we li lived in this city when that I really started to play ball. That was in 1906 when I was only 16. I pitched for the town team. It was only amateur ball, you know. But that was the big thing in those days. We used to play all of the surrounding Kansas towns. Like High Point, Ransom, Ellis, Be Basin, Waukeny, Scott City, nearby places like that in Kansas. A ball game between two rival towns was a big event back then. With parades before the game and everything, the small only the town, the more important their ball club was. Boy, if you beat a, a bigger town, they'd practically hand you the key to the city. And if you lost the game by making an error in the ninth inning or something like that, well, they bet this thing to do was just pack a grip and hit the road, because they'd never let you forget it. Anyway, I was only 16, I was... And I was the Nest City's pitcher, even though I was the youngest on the team by a good two or three years. I had a terrific fastball with the hop on it, even and then, and I also played in the infield when and I didn't pitch. A funny thing about that happened in September 1906, when I, I'm not too keen in about talking about, but I guess it wouldn't be exactly right to act like it never happened. In a nutshell, that's when I started my professional career, and I might as well just take a deep breath and come right out, out and put the matter blunty. The team I started with was called the Bloomer Girls. Yeah, you heard that right, the Bloomer Girls. One day in September, the Bloomer Girls came into Nest City in those days. There were several Bloomer Girls teams that barnstormed around the country, like the House of David did 20 or 30 years later. The girls were advertised on posters around this city for weeks before they arrived, you know, and they finally came to town and played us, and we beat them. Well, after the game, the, the fellow who managed them asked me if I'd like to join them and finish the tour with them. There was only three weeks left of the trip, and he offered me $20 if I play the infield with them in those last three weeks. Are you kidding? I said. I thought the guy must have been off his rocker. Listen, he said. You know I, as well as I do that uh, all those bloomer girls aren't really girls. The third baseman's real name is Bill Compton, not Dolly Madison. And that's lit. that pitcher's Lady Waddle isn't Rube's sister. If anything, he's his brother. Well... I figured as much, I said, but those guys are wearing wigs. If you think I'm going to put a wig on, you're crazy. No need to, he said. With your baby face, you won't need one anyway. So I asked Dad if I could go. He thought it was sort of unusual, but he didn't raise any objections. I guess it must have appealed to his sense of the absurd. Fact is... There were or four boys on the team, me, Lady Waddle, Dolly Madison, and one other, the catcher. There were The other five were girls. In case you're wondering how the situation was in the locker room, we didn't have clubhouses or locker rooms in those days. We dressed in our uniforms at the hotel and rode out to the ballpark from there. I think everybody except so, maybe some of the farmer boys must have known some of us weren't actually girls, but the crowds turned out and had a lot of fun anyway. If you're, in case you're interested, by the way, the first team Roger Hornsby ever played on was called the Bloom, was a Bloomers Girls team too. So I'm not in such bad company. It was the next year, 1907, that I really got started in organized ball. With Hutchinson and the Western Association, it all came in about uh, by accident. My brother Harley was going to the University of Kansas at the time, and he happened to tell a friend of his about me. This friend knew Belden Hill, who ran the Cedar Rapids Club in the 3I League. And as a result, I 
was offered a contract with Cedar Rapids in January of 1907. $90 a month, that's what it's called for. Before it came time to report to Cedar Rapids, however, Mr. Hill decided he didn't really need me after all, and he gave my contract to his friend Doc Anders, Andrews, who managed the Hutchinson Club in the Western Association. He didn't sell me, he just gave me away. So, in the spring of 1907, Dad and I got on a train for Hutchinson, Kansas. My father didn't have any objections to me playing baseball, but I was only 17 years old and he wanted to make sure this was a proper environment. So he came to <coughs> Hutchinson with me to make sure everything was alright. Hutchinson's only a, a, a little over a hundred miles from Nest City, so it wasn't too far from home. I had a pretty good year that a year it won about 20 games and struck out over 200 men. After the 1907 season and was over, I was sold to Kansas City in the American Association. I pitched there until the middle of 1908 when John I. Taylor bought me from the Boston Red Sox, and I reported to the Red Sox that August. Rib Marquardt came up to the, the Giants from Indianapolis a month later. We pitched against each other many and many a time. And when he was with Indianapolis, when I was with Kansas City, we both went up to the big leagues at particularly the same time. Neither one of us was 19 years old yet. Rube turned 19 on October 9th that year, and me 16 days later. Four years later, we faced each other again in the 1912 World Series, and then again eight years after that in 1920. By then, both of us had been in around a long, long time, but neither one of us had reached our 31st birthday yet. Of course, that Red Sox team I joined in 1908 turned out to become one of the best teams of all time. Tris Beaker had been on the club early that year, but he had had farmed out to Little Rock where he hit 350 and led the league. Came back up a few weeks after I got there, and we started to room together. And we roomed together for 15 years, first with, with the Red Sox, and later with the Cleveland Indians. All the years I was in the American League, my roommate was Tris Speaker. There was nobody even close to that man as an outfielder, except maybe Harry Hooper. Speaker maybe er, played a real shallow center field, and he had a terrific instinct at the crack of the bat. He'd all be off with his back to the infield and he'd turn that glance over his shoulder at the last minute and catch the ball so it no easy it looked like there was nothing into it at all nobody else was even in the same league with him harry hooper joined the red sox the, the next year he was the closest i ever saw to speaker as a as a fielder it's a real shame harry was on the same in club as spoke having to play all those years in the in his shadow just like Lou Gehrig with Babe Ruth and or Sam Crawford with Ty Cobb. Won 11 games for the Red Sox in 1909, 12 in 1910, and then 23, including a no-hitter, in 1911, 34 in 1912. That was my greatest season, 1912. 34 wins, 16 in a row, three more in, in the World Series, and of course beating Walter Johnson won nothing in that big game at Fenway Park on October 6, 1912. It was on a Friday. My regular pitching turn was scheduled to, oh, to come on Saturday, and they moved it up a, a day so that Walter and I could face each other. Walter had already had won 16 in a row, and his streak had ended. I had won 13 in a row, and they challenged our manager, Jack Stahl, to pitch me against Walter so Walter could had stopped my streak himself. Jake agreed, and the match had us against each other, and he moved me up in the rotation from Saturday to Friday. Newspapers publicized us like, like prize fighters giving statistics comparing our height, weight, biceps, triceps, arm span, and whatnot. The champion Walter Johnson versus the challenger Joe Wood. That was the only game I ever I remember in Fenway Park or anywhere else for that matter where the fans were sitting practically along the first base and third base lines. Instead of sitting back where the bench usually is, we were sitting on chairs right up against the foul lines, and the fans were right behind us. Overflow had been packed between 
in the grandstand and the foul lines, as well as the outfield and behind ropes. Fenway Park must have contained twice as many people as its seating oh capacity goodness. that day. What? Oh, oh, I never saw so many people in my life. Up in one place. In fact, fans were, were put on the field in a, an hour before the game started. And it was so crowded down there, I hardly had room to warm up. Well, I won. Won nothing. But don't let that fool you. In my opinion, the greatest pitcher who ever lived was Walter Johnson. If he ever had a good ball club behind him, what records he, he would have upset. You know, I got a bigger thrill out of, of winning three games in the World Series that fall. Especially the first game when we beat, beat the Giants 4-3. to in the last of the ninth inning, and they got Chief Myers on second base and Buck Herzog on third with only one out. And I started to get a little nervous. Only one run ahead of two Gi and two Giants in scoring position. Sack fly would have tied it and, it, and a hit would have beaten us. But I struck out both Art Fletcher and Otis Crandall. We won it, and they saw the... The first time Crandall ever struck out at the polo grounds. I fanned him with the fastball over the outside corner. I doubt if he ever saw it, even though he swung at it. The count was 3-2, and two, and the pitch was one of the fastest balls I ever threw in my life. That series we won in the 10th inning of the game, the last game, the, the last game you always hear about, Snodgrass dropping the fly ball, but you never hear about the incredible catch that Harry Hooper made in the 5th inning. They saved if the game for us that was the thing that really took the, the heart out of uh, the Giants excuse me a minute yes. Larry Doyle hit a terrific drop line drive to a deep right center and then Harry took or ran back at full speed and dove over the railing and into the crowd in some way he'll never figure out quite how he caught the ball I think with his bare hand it was almost impossible to believe when you saw it boy if there was any one characteristic of harry hoopers it was that he was a clutch player when the chips were down the guy played like wild fire in the 1915 world series you know he got two homers in the last game of the series and the second one and won the game and for it won the game and the series for us just to give you an idea of how Harry played in the clutch, those two homers in that one series game matched the total number he hit all season long. So there I was after the 1912 season, including the 1912 World Series. I won 37 games and lost only six, struck out 279 men in days when the boys didn't strike out much, and I've beaten Walter Johnson and Christy Matthewson, one after the other. And do you know how old I was? Well, I was 22 years old. That's all. The brightest future ahead of me that anybody could imagine in their wildest dreams. Do you know uh, something else? That was it. That was it right there and then and there. My arm went bad the next year and all my dreams came tumbling down around my ears like a damn house of cards. The next five years seemed like it was nothing but one long terrible nightmare i was fine that winter in 1912 after the series we went back to boston and got reception and so that would make your head spin i rode through the city in the same car with manager jake stahl and mayor john fitzgerald and that was honey fitz president kennedy's grandfather he was the mayor of boston then honey fitz had gone back and forth on the train with us between knee Boston and New York, so not as much, not to miss a single game of the World Series. The Red Sox had a contingent of fans called the Royal Rooters, and their theme song was something called Tessie. Old Honey Fitz used to sing Tessie for a few days after that. He came home with me for a few days around, around here. Then it happened. In the spring of 1913, I went to a field the ground ball on wet grass and I slipped and fell on my thumb broke it the thumb on my pitching hand it was in a cast for two or three weeks I don't know whether I tried to pitch too soon after that 
or whether maybe something happened to my shoulder at the same time. But whatever it was, I never pitched again without a terrific amount of pain in my right that shoulder never again. I expected to have such a great year in 1913. Um, I did manage to win 11 games, only lose 5, and I struck out an average of 10 men a game. But it wasn't the same. The old zip was gone from that fastball. It didn't hop in anymore like it used to. The season after that, I only won 9 and lost 3. 1915, won 14, lost 5. But my arm was getting worse and worse. The pain was getting almost unbearable after the, each game I pitched. I have to lay off for a couple weeks before or I could er, even and lift my arm up. Still in 1915, I led the league in ERA, the earned run average of 1.49. In the winter of 1915, I was desperate. I must have gone to hundreds of doctors over the previous three years and nobody seemed to be able to help me. Nowadays, a shot cortisone un, in, um, would probably do the job in the flash, but that was over 50 years ago, you know. Hell, they didn't even know about insulin back then, not to mention cortisone, cortisone, whatever. Finally, somebody told me about a chiropractor in New York. So every week that winter, 1915-16, I took a train to New York and this fellow worked on my uh, back and arm. All very hush hush and unmarked office behind locked doors because in those days it wasn't legal for a chiropractor to practice. After each treatment, this chiropractor wanted me to throw long, as long and as hard as I could possibly could. He said it wouldn't hurt, but it would hurt, but that's what he wanted me to do. So after he went through working on me, I'd go up to Columbia University where Andy Coakley was the baseball coach, and I'd go into the corner of a gym and throw a baseball as hard as I could. I'd do that until I wasn't able to stand the pain anymore, and I do mean pain. After about an hour, I couldn't lift my arm as high as my belt. I had to use my left hand to put my right hand into my coat pocket. And if I go do a movie in the evening, I couldn't get my right arm up enough to put up on the arm seat, or on the armrest. So in 1916, I didn't play at all. I retired. Stayed on the farm here, fed chickens, just thought and thought about the whole situation. Only 26 years old. And all washed up. A has been, I put up a trapeze in the attic and I hang on it on that for hours to stretch my arm out. Maybe that would help, but who could say? But it did. Stayed on the farm all through 1916. That fall I began to, to get restless. Well, that's putting it mildly. What it was, I was begin began to get restless and that's putting it mildly. What it was, I was starting to gnaw on woodwork, and I was getting so frustrated, maybe I could come back. So what if I couldn't pitch anymore? Damn it. I, in 1912, I hit 290 in addition to winning 34 games. So I could hit, and I could run, and I could field. And if I couldn't pitch, why couldn't I do something else? Doggone, I was a ball player, not just a pitcher. I phoned my best friend, Tris Speaker, and told him I wanted to, to try again. Spoke had been traded from the Red Sox to the Cleveland Indians just before 1916 season started. Tris said he'd, he'd see what he could do. Meanwhile, the Red Sox had given me a permission to, ma to make any deal for myself I wanted. Provided it with the satisfactory with them. So on February 24th of 1917, I was sold to the Cleveland Indians for $15,000 and once again I went to spring training this time with Cleveland all of 27 years old and a relic from the distant past. I'd hear fathers tell their kids, see that guy over there that Smokey Joe Wood used to be a great pitcher long ago. Lee Fole was managing Cleveland at the time when, and he encouraged me every way he could and for my part that I tried to show him that I could do more than pitch. I played in the infield during field and practice. I shagged flies in the outfield, and I was ready to pinch run, pinch hit. I'd have carried the water bucket if they had water boys in baseball. 
the hell with my pride. It wasn't the invinci I wasn't the invincible Joe Wood anymore. I was just another ball player who wanted a job and wanted it bad. And it paid off. My arm never did come back, but the next year, 1918, they got at sort of players because of the war, and I was given a shot at, at an outfield job. Well, I made it. I hit 296 that season, and for five years, I played in the outfield for Cleveland. 1921, I hit 366. Could have been in there longer, too, but I wasn't as satisfied. I figured I'd prove them something in myself. So in 1923, when Yale offered me a position as baseball coach at the same salary as I was getting from Cleveland, I took it, coached there at Yale for 20 years from 1923 to 1942. My biggest thrill came one day in 1918, shortly after they gave me a chance in the outfield. That day, we beat the Yankees 3-2 in a game and that lasted 19 innings. It was at the Polo Grounds, which is where the Giants played their games at the time. Same ballpark. That lasted 19 innings. Anyway, where six years ago I won three World Series games as a pitcher for Boston. Sorry, I, I, I lost track. But now as an outfielder for Cleveland, I hit two home runs and the second one came in 19th inning and broke up into the ball game. <clears throat> broke up the ball game. What a wonderful day that was. The game is still the longest game I've ever played at the Polo Grounds. And even today, only five games into the history of the American League have lasted longer. Stanley Kovalitsky pitched the whole game for us, all 19 innings of it. In the top of the seventh, I slammed one into the left field bleachers in the ninth inning. I saved the game with the catch. Didn't think I could make it myself. In the twelfth, I threw a man out at second. And then in the top of the 19th, I cracked another one into the left field seats. Kobe sent the Yankees down one. Then 2 3 in the bottom of the 19th and won it 3 2. That was one of the biggest days of my life. May 24th, 1918. The season wasn't pretty young yet, and I hadn't been in the outfield very long. It was up to me to show Lee Bull I could do the job, but from that day on, he knew I could do it, and so did I. And the worst was finally over.